We turn our attention again this morning to Romans chapter 2. Romans 2. And we'll begin reading in verse 12 and go through verse 16. That's, that's the text we'll concentrate on this morning. Before I get there, let me remind you of some important things. This Wednesday night, we pick up again with our James study and our junior, uh, our high school class on James and our parents study on gospel-centered, the gospel-centered parent and our elementary classes. That p picks up this Wednesday night now again. For dinner, we're having taco salad. With the, had some wonderful meals this fall, so $3.00 meal, dessert, drink. So come and join us. If you haven't joined us yet, it's a, it's a great time to start and just be here Wednesday night for dinner at 6 and the study at 6.50. Next Sunday is fifth Sunday, last one of this year, I think. And so we have lunch on fifth Sunday. And this year, uh, we're going to give, or this time we're going to give Philip a break because he's been doing so much cooking for us. And we're going to bring in all the fried chicken and chicken strips for the kids. You just bring the sides and some desserts. We'll have a good fellowship next Sunday. Maybe the weather will be just like this and the kids can get outside and play. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful day for us to fellowship. So don't skip out on fifth Sunday, the lunch part. It's a lot of fun. Now, on Wednesday nights, I need to let you know that we have to meet the next two consecutive Wednesday nights instead of skipping one. We had to crowd one in together because we needed to get in eight sessions before Thanksgiving. So for the next two weeks, we're going to meet, then skip a week, and then have our final session. We'll, we'll keep you abreast of that so you will remember. Also, very important, this, this is um, the month that we nominate new elders. That information is in... The bulletin, you can see who's rotating off our session. We need three new elders to come on. And if you haven't picked up your elders' cards, like uh, the Alta Peters, they've been on an extended vacation, and the Hares, your cards are out there on that information desk. Just pick those up. Where are they all? Oh, there you go. Uh, pick up your cards, and next week is our last Sunday to turn those uh, elder nomination cards in. Also, we have a new book for the fall that we got in this week, C.S. Lewis's classic work called Mere Christianity. You need to get this book. If you've never read anything of C.S. Lewis, this would be the one to start with. And it's only five bucks. And pick up the book it's, and enjoy this man's critical thinking about Christianity. It will absolutely encourage and amaze you. I'm going to reference C.S. Lewis this morning in our sermon. Let's look in Romans 12. Or Romans 2, beginning in verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Now notice that Paul now is setting forward. There are two, to him, there are two. Basically, two groups of people on the earth. Those who live out apart from the law and those who are living under the law. you, you got to get that. It's important this morning. For not the hearers of the law are just in, in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now that raises a question for those of us who are evangelical, and we believe in the doctrine of justification by faith alone. I don't have time this morning to really uh, spend a lot of time on that verse. It comes, that whole doctrine comes up later, and we'll, we'll address that, and I'll explain what Paul is saying in verse 13 in a few weeks. But look at verse 14 through 16. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, see there's that one general group, when they do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. He's explaining what he said in verse 12. Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness. And between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. 
In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the Gospels. All right. There are two basic groups. Those who are living apart from the law and those who are living under the law or with the law. Uh, have you ever heard of the Joshua Project? Anyone ever done any reading about the Joshua Project? Philip, I thought maybe you would have. But the Joshua Project is an organization that tracks the number of people who have not been reached by the gospel. And I did a little research this week to make sure my uh, facts were up to date. Anyone want to venture how many people alive today on this earth who have yet to have heard the gospel. They've never heard of the person Jesus Christ. We had, we had the guess last night how many uh, candy corns were in this jar and you win a prize and my number was w way off. And I think, I think they rigged it so a certain person would win. <laughs> but I guess I don't know, 3,016, and it's something like 800 and something in there, but anyway, I was way off. 600 and something. <laughs> you know how many, do you know how many people today, alive today on this earth, have not heard the gospel, never heard the name Jesus Christ? According to the Joshua Project, between 3 and 4.2 billion people. And that is, to me, that is stunning in our age of technology. And how aggressively denominations, mainline denominations, have aggressively sent missionaries all over the world. And yet there are that many people who have not heard the name Jesus Christ. And you know, of that group of people, the estimation is 66,000 of them will die every day. Having no knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now this raises a question. It had all, I've always had this concern. And you probably have asked this question yourself. Of those people now who will die without ever hearing the name Jesus Christ, how can they stand before God and be condemned? Or will they stand before God and will God excuse them because they've never heard the gospel? Which is it? See, I, I personally, I mean, I'm troubled to think that people who have never heard the name Jesus Christ will stand before God and He will say, you will perish. Now, if there ever was a place in the Scriptures, uh, in all of Paul's writing, and he wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, if there ever was a place where Paul could make that clear, finally settle that answer, or that question for us, and say, hey, those people will be they will be excused. If there ever was a place, it would be right here in Romans 2. In our text today. And yet, he tells us just the opposite. That there are people alive without the law. That is, what Paul meant by the law was the Old Testament. And you know, the Jews were gifted. They were given the scriptures it was hand-delivered. God delivered it to Moses, and Moses took it down to Israel. They had the law. And that, of course, first was the Ten Commandments, and then it later included the whole Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. They were given the law. And so they lived their lives according to the law. And yet, Paul says, there's another group of people who live outside of that law, apart from the Word, the revealed Word of God, and yet those people too will be found guilty. They, they too will perish. Why? Why will they perish? Well, he answers that, and we need to look at that this morning. The answer is found in our text. All who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law. And, verse 12, this is verse 12, all who live under the law will also be judged by the law. In other words, when all people stand before God, they're going to be, in a sense, on equal footing because everybody had enough information. Even those who've never heard the name Jesus Christ has enough information. 
I'm going to show you that this morning. This is what Paul is teaching. Now, before we get there, we, we've got to understand something about the judgment of God. And I want to show you briefly five principles of God's judgment are, that are found in Romans chapter 2. It, what Paul does is present a hypothetical case. If anyone could actually persist in fulfilling the law, obeying the law completely, then that person will be given eternal life. That's the hypothetical case. But we know the answer to that question. No one could. Only one human being was able to fulfill the law completely, and he was divine. Human and divine. That's Jesus Christ. So that's why Paul can say, and you can appreciate better the context, all have sinned. All those people who have never heard the name Jesus Christ, who have lived apart from the law, the word, the revelation of God's word, and those who have been benefactors of this book, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, let me say this to you. Why spend time in this part of, of the scripture? I mean, this is, this is hard stuff. It's... it's uh, it's bad news, we could say. Why do we spend time in this? Well, a couple of things. Number one, we need to preach the whole counsel of God. And Romans 2 is part of the word of God. And God had it written for us today. So we need to love this part of Scripture as much as we love John 3.16. And then hopefully... By studying these difficult passages in the Word of God, we will be impressed of the urgency and the need to share the gospel. See, people are dying. People are perishing. And by the way, I know we live in the Bible Belt, and we think, you know, we have this saying, everybody around us has heard the gospel. They have not. There are people in your neighborhood who have never heard the gospel. Trust me. They may have heard of the name Jesus Christ. They may have heard of the term the gospel. You would be surprised how many people in DeSoto County have never had the gospel explained to them. So studying this impresses upon us that we need to be willing to share the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, people are perishing. The, the greatest threat, if you will, the greatest concern we should have is not who becomes the next president of the United States. The greatest concern, the thing that sh should keep us aware and alert and concerned is not who will win the election, but people are perishing without Jesus Christ. And secondly, we will better appreciate the gift of salvation that God has made a way for everyone now look at these five principles they're, uh, they're, they're five but they're very short number one five principles of God's judgment found in Romans 2 first of all and Wade covered this last week God's judgment is according to truth Romans 2 2 look back at Romans 2 2 but we know that the judgment of God is according to what? Truth. Against those who practice such things. Truth. Have any of you ever served on a jury? You had a jury and you got selected and you served on a jury. Have, have any of you ever been a witness in a trial? We have some of that too. You know, I'm not real comfortable in a courtroom because that's not a familiar place with me. And I have a high respect for what goes on in our courtrooms. We ought to. And you know, in the olden days, I don't think they do it anymore, but in the olden days, if you were called to the stand, you would put one hand on the Bible and you would raise the other hand and you would repeat these words, I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Why is that so important? It's important because if justice is to be served, we must do our very best to find the truth. 
And you know, often when I sit down to help people who are struggling with a uh, conflict in their life, like maybe it's marriage issues, and, and I can remember helping families, families trying to settle di financial disputes. And I, you know what I'll do? The first, when I sit down with these people, I'll start this way. Father, I pray that you will reveal to us the truth. I pray that truth will be known. Why? So that we can make good judgment. And what I'm sharing with you this morning is with, with God, His judgment is always according to truth. His verdict will always be just because ju God's judgment is always perfect. Why? Because His judgment is according to full knowledge and full truth. He knows everything at all times always. He knows everything in your heart right now. So never forget this. All secrets and all hearts are open to God. And no one will be able to lie in God's court. Secondly, God's judgment is proportionate to human sin. Maybe you didn't know that. Look in verse 5, chapter 2. Paul says that he's, when he's speaking of sinners in verse 5, he says, as these sinners as treasuring up for yourselves are storing up for yourselves what? Wrath. Against the day of God's wrath. That day is coming. And the implication here is that there are some people who will stand before God and their sin, the way they live their life, will be far worse than others. You know, Adolf Hitler was really a bad dude, wasn't he? Not everybody lived a life like that. Adolf Hitler stored up wrath, a certain amount of wrath. And he, so, and he will be judged according to how he lived. Those who sin much will be punished accordingly. And those who sin less, there are a lot of good people in the world who live, try to live morally clean lives. And they will be judged according to how they lived. Thirdly, God's judgment is according to righteousness. See, verse 5 again, Paul points to the righteous judgment of God. There will be nothing wrong about God's judgment. Nothing. It will be according to the highest possible standard and a faultless moral code. Because God is righteous in all He is and in all He does. Fourthly, God's judgment is impartial. Verse 11, we didn't read that this morning. For there is no partiality with God. <laughs> no partiality. See, in human courts, sometimes the judge is impressed to show some leniency. Maybe some partiality. Now that sometimes uh, people will get arrested and are charged with a crime and they have to go to court and they need character witnesses and you know sometimes the pastor goes. Do you know that? Sometimes the pastor goes to be a character witness for this. In fact my brother was some years ago. A, a member of his congregation uh, was arrested by a game warden for killing too many ducks. And ducks are federal, a federal bird, federal game. And then they fall under the federal system. It's a federal crime. And so he had to go to this federal court. And he asked his pastor to go with him. So my brother is an avid hunter. So he went along with his, his member to the court. And, and, and he was right there with this man. And this man stood before the judge. There was no jury. It was just to, to be... Uh, find out his penalty, and my brother stood, and the and the judge asked who this person was, and he said, "I'm this is my pastor, Reverend Hall," and and so the judge questioned the man about his his uh, deed, and then he did something surprising. He looked over at my brother, and he said, 
Reverend Hall, do you duck hunt? And my brother said, yes, sir, I do. He said, have you ever shot over the limit, killed more than the limit? And my brother said, yes, sir, I have. And then my brother said, or asked, judge, have you? <laughs> and the judge said, yes, sir, I have. <laughs> and he was lenient that day on my brother's church member. So there, you know, sometimes the judgment you know, uh, in our courts today, there, there's some lenience or preferential treatment. Not so with God. At the final judgment, all will be judged according to the same impartial standards and procedures. For Paul wrote, see, that's what we're learning, verse 11, God does not show favoritism. Partiality. Then fifthly, God's judgment is according to people's deeds. Paul devoted a lot of time in chapter 2. And we'll see it. we got about two more Sundays in chapter 2. But he, he devotes a lot of time to this principle. And so it must have been very important. Paul says in verse 6, last week's text, God will give to each person according to what he has done. It's not what we know or even what we say we do that matters. See, God knows and will always know how we actually perform, and we stand, how we, whether we stand up or fall morally. So those are some principles of God's judgment that we learn here in chapter 2. We should not forget those principles. We have a just God who always knows the truth and He will judge accordingly to that perfect knowledge, and his judgment will always be righteous. So let's look at these two groups quickly this morning. First of all, let's look at the Jews who, who were sinners under the law. That's, that's who Paul was thinking of in the first century. His own heritage. The Jews were privileged to have the word of God given to them. And Paul was thinking about his fellow Jew when he wrote that text. And can you imagine how his fellow Jews might have responded to what Paul said? I mean, and, and Paul had himself in mind. He knew the kind of person he used to be. Can you imagine how they responded to as many as have sinned under the law, us Jews, we will be judged by that same law. And these were people, some of these people who were reading this letter were people who were, I mean, really orthodox in their faith. They weren't casual Jews. They were practicing Jews. Some of them were Pharisees and Sadducees. And, and Paul was living in a time when Jerusalem was still the Mecca of, the, of Judaism. And if you lived anywhere close to that place, you went to the temple to pray during the hours of prayer. And you fasted when you needed to fast. You meditated upon the law. Every time the word was read aloud, you were there. You didn't miss church. Because you, you, just, you believed that you had to keep this law. And I suppose Paul could almost hear his fellow, fellow Jews rattling off their accomplishments, their pedigree. Paul had really had one himself. You know what Paul, how Paul described himself? Philippians, circumcised on the eighth day, check that off the list, of the people of Israel, that's an advantage, of the tribe of Benjamin, wow, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, he was a Pharisee. As for zeal, did Paul have any zeal? He sure did. He sought out Christians to have them killed and imprisoned. As for legalistic righteousness, Paul said he was faultless. He, he knew the thinking, the mindset of his generation. You remember the story in, in Luke 18 of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Remember when that tax, or the Pharisee, goes to pray in the temple and the tax collector happens to be there right beside him and they're both praying and they pray different prayers and you remember the Pharisees prayer oh Lord I, I thank you that I'm not like other people 
robbers, evildoers, adulterers. And then he has the gall to say, I'm not even like this guy next to me, this tax collector. And then the tax collector prays an entirely different prayer. My point is, really, this existed, this mindset existed, that they had indeed measured up to this law. And Paul says, no. There was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus, was impressed by his teacher teaching and said, teacher or rabbi, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the law. Keep it. And you know what he said? I have done that from my youth up. That was their mindset. Later, Paul's going to deal with that, that topic, and we'll see it. The, the false hope of the religious person. But for now, he's focusing upon their actual performances. I know you know the law. The question is, do you keep it in your heart? He reminds them that there's, there are not those, it's not about those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who actually obey the law in their heart. This is, this is the point, guys, at, at which we, each of us, fall down. We, we, we don't measure up. Since so, then we are condemned by the law, having failed to live up to its standards, what do we need to do? Well, Paul, his whole purpose is, since we can't measure up to the law, we've got to find another way apart from the law. There's got to be another way. And this is where Paul is going. See, that's why we're being set up here. How could Gentiles be condemned by the law? Having not been given the law. So we have to answer that question still. But because Paul wrote, all who sin apart from the law will perish by the law. Uh, once again, you see, doesn't that put Romans 3.23 into better context. We've, we've memorized that scripture since we were a child, but now it really jumps out at us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. People who have the law, people who never heard of Jesus Christ, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what Paul was saying. But how, again, how, do, how, do these, how will these people be condemned and they've never heard Jesus Christ? Thankfully, Paul gives us the answer and it's found in, in really two parts in verse 14 and 15. Look at verses 14 and 15. Did you pick this up? The Gentiles, that's the group he was thinking about. Not the Jew, but the Gentile. And that would technically include... Every person today alive that has never heard Jesus Christ, never had the law, never had the privilege of hearing the law. You know what he says? Yet they have, what? The law written where? On their hearts. God is just. There's a law written in their hearts. Number two, they also possess... A conscience. He uses that word. We, our word is translated conscience in the text. That tells this man or woman they ought to obey this law. And it also, this conscience that God has given us, condemns us when we do not. Now this is important for us. It introduces for the first time in Romans what the older theologians called the moral law. Or the law of nature. Now listen, don't confuse that with general revelation. That is, we know there's a God because the heavens declare the glory of God. We're talking now about a moral law that's written on the hearts of men. And the older theologians called that 
more, the moral law. Some of them called it the natural revelation. That is, there is a moral code or order in our hearts that God has placed there. All people possess it. They've not, maybe they haven't heard of the law of God written in this book, but they have something like it in their hearts. The phrase Paul uses, they have a law for themselves. Now follow his thinking. It's, this is brilliant. And that law written in their heart is enough, he says, to condemn them before a holy God. I got this book, C.S. Lewis. And one of the reasons I, I, I got it in is because in studying Romans, I, I thought of C.S. Lewis, and I said, this would be a good time to introduce the book. But there was, there was no person alive in the 20th century that better communicated what I'm trying to preach this morning than C.S. Lewis. He had the kind of mind that could take what theologians could complicate and reduce it to very practical, simple terms so that we could understand. And that's what he does in his book, Mere Christianity, when he talks about this moral law. This, there's a law written in man's heart. God put it there. You don't need the Bible God's already written it in your hearts. And, and then C.S. Lewis presents this case. And it's just so simple. You need to get the book and read it. One of the books that follows this is called The Problem of Pain. Read that one after you read Mere Christianity. It will really help you understand what I'm trying to preach this morning. But Lewis stated that when people argue with one another, say you have a dispute with your neighbor over... Um, the color you painted your house. And uh, it's not just that they disagree with you. See, the, the, real, the real point is that you have violated a code. So I live in a neighborhood that has a code. And when we buy a home in there, we, just, we sign that we accept our covenants. And Lewis would say, what, you see, it's not that they just don't agree with purple, they have violated a code. And that, see, that's what he's saying. There's a law written in our hearts that tells us when we violate a code. And that condemns us. How is this? I can tell you a story. Um, I told it before. So, but it was so long ago, all of you that heard it have forgotten it, so it'll sound new to you this morning. Several years ago, Carl and I were in Manhattan on a vacation with another couple. And our last day, we decided, uh, the, the last morning we were there, we'd had to go to the airport, we decided we would splurge and we, we rented a limousine to pick us up at the ho hotel. We didn't want to deal with trains and subways. And so this limousine driver gets there on time. We put our luggage in the trunk, and there's four of us, and I get elected to sit in the front seat with the limo driver. And it's about an hour's traffic drive to get to the airport from where we were. I had plenty of time to get to know the driver. And immediately we struck up a conversation, and I, d I just knew he, you know, that he had this look of being Jewish. And uh, sure enough, he, he, was, uh, he was a Jew. And he had only been in the States for like three years. And I said, well, listen, where, where did you, what part of Israel did you, I was raised in Tel Aviv. I said, well, did you, uh, did your parents raise you as a, oh, yes, strict Judaism. Went to all the schools I had to go to. And um, turns out when he came of age, he turned away from his faith. And here's this Jewish man who's saying, I'm an atheist. I don't believe there is a God. I said, wow. Don't, you don't find many Jews that don't believe in God. And so the conversation went on. And, and then I said, well, how do you like the United States and all that? And he, then he began to tell me, that, tell us, that he uh, really was disappointed. There's so much crime, he said. People, people are, will cheat and... They will rob people. And it is just wrong. I mean, that was basically what he was, he was complaining to us. And I said, that's my window. There it is. I said, and I'll call him Saul. I can't remember his name, but Saul's a good 
Jew, Jewish names. I said, Saul, listen, do you understand what you're saying? If there is no God, then why, why are you making these moral judgments? That's what he was doing. He was saying, I recognize when there is wrong, and I recognize something that's right. You know why he was able to do that, even though he denied the existence of God? Because there's a moral code written in his heart. And God put it there. And I told him that. I said, listen, the only way you can make an absolute moral judgment, is that there must be an absolute standard. And that comes from a God who is holy and righteous. If not, throw everything out the window. Now, let's look here as we close this morning. There are three internal witnesses, Paul says, that we have. And this will help you as we close up. There is, first of all, the law of nature. We talked about that. The law of human nature. You know, there's a... There's physical laws. If I got on the church this morning and you gathered out there on the lawn at church and I jumped, what do you expect will happen? I'm going to fall and break a bone. Because those laws of physical nature are always at work, right? Well, there are also moral laws that are at work that God has placed in this world. But there's a difference. In the moral law, the moral realm, we have choices we have a free will, and we can break the moral code, the law of nature. Then secondly, there is inside of us what we've called, we've mentioned this morning, the conscience. We have a conscience. There's a second accuser. And the conscience, in verse 15, bearing witness, bearing witness. See, the law of nature and the, and the law of the conscience are close, but they are different in some ways. The law of nature is is an objective standard, very clear. My three-year-old grandson, Bailey, is aware of the law of nature. He doesn't know that term, but he, he has a knowledge, even as, at three years old. Sometimes he will look at you with those pretty eyes and that curly hair, and there will be a little smile on his face, and he is asking a question, am I going to get away with this or not? See, he has this conscience uh, or the law of nature working knowledge in his mind already. And God has placed that there. But then there's the conscience. And that comes, it, it comes in as we mature. Conscience begins to develop. See, my eight-year-old, his conscience is more developed than the three-year-old. And sometimes Ethan will do something offensive. And you know what? He will sometimes just automatically apologize. And, and most often his apology is really genuine. It comes from the heart because you know what he wants? He wants to be in right relationship with Pops. His conscience is telling him he has violated a law. See, knowledge shows us what is right. The conscience approves or condemns us. Then there's the memory. Verse 15. Did you just pick up this? Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bear witness between them, their thoughts accusing. That's the mind, the memory. Why is the memory so important? Because it's something within ourselves that can and will condemn us, even without an external judging word from God written in the Bible. So here's, here's the picture. What a picture Paul has painted for us. Three accusers, the law of nature, the conscience, and the memory. And they're combining as an internal witness to prove that even the person without the law, including people who have never heard of Jesus Christ, will be condemned apart from the law. So, how do you close after preaching something like that? Well, you have to think about the gospel. And when we speak of the gospel, we must speak of both the negative and the positive of the gospel. You see, true repentance follows the understanding of one's condition, moral depravity. 
That's why I encourage our parents, when you're teaching your children and you're wondering, are they old enough? I tell our parents, look, the issue is, do they understand sin? And that they stand condemned before a holy God. See, that's the negative aspect of the gospel. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And secondly, if we understand the scriptures rightly, we know that the law was never meant to save us. The law was a teacher, a tutor, that shows us how far off we are. And it shows us that we need to find another way. And it will stop us from attempting to find justification in our religion or our works. It can't be found there. That's the negative. Here's the positive. Here's the good and glorious news of the gospel. One of the words Paul used in our text today was the powerful word, perish. And it has tremendous ramifications. All the load of that word, perish. And I said people are perishing today. 66,000 of those people in that unreached group will die in the next 24 hours. But when we think of that and all that it implies, it should cause us to remember one of the best known passages in all the Bible. You know it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish. That's the gospel. Jesus died to open the way for us. And if we trust in God, in Christ Jesus, we will not perish. I was with Chris and his family Friday at the hospital down here in Olive Branch. And Chris's mother has about two months to live. It, the, the, the cancer is so advanced that the, the doctor said, we're not, we're not going to do chemotherapy. It will just make her sick. And it will not, it will not save her lives. Now, how do you minister to people like that? You know what I said to Chris's family and, and to Miss Brown, Miss Jackie, and to Mr. Brown, who's going to lose a wife of many, many years? I said, you know, f because we're Christians, we have to look at life, no, no matter what happens, for us, it's a win-win. If God lets me live, great. For me to live is Christ. If God takes me tomorrow, next month, with cancer, I still win. I'll be with him. That's the gospel. Let's thank him for it. And let's share that good news with people. Would you pray with me this morning? As we prepare to leave and go to our homes, let's take just a few minutes. And ask the Holy Spirit to ingrain the words of Romans 2 in our hearts and in our minds. Now, the message can have different implications and can be, the Holy Spirit can be asking different things of us. There might be some here who have been trying to live a good moral life and hoping that in the end, there will be enough good and God will say, okay, you made it. But we've learned this morning that we can never be good enough because God is righteous and perfect and holy. He demands the same from His people, the same from us. And the only way we can have that is if someone else gives it to us. And that's what Jesus did. When he died, he took your sins. All your moral failures. Everything. All of them. Those that you will commit ten years from now. 
They've been paid for. They've been covered. He took those sins. And he gave you his righteousness. See, that's the deal. And that's a great deal. And that's what the gospel offers this morning. So if you're depending upon your moral good code, abandon that, jettison it, get rid of it, and turn to Christ. Rest in Him, trust in Him, in what He has done for you. Repent of your sins. Accept Him, trust Him. And then for those of us who are here and we have received that gift. We know Christ as Lord and Savior. There are other implications for us. And I've already mentioned those in the sermon. There should be an urgency about us. It should make the Christian life so much more important. It's not something that just makes us feel good. Hey, we went to church today. But we walk out of here with a, with a mission a purpose. Father, we thank you again this morning for your word. Some of it is difficult. We, we know that. But it has a glorious purpose. We thank you for the, the epistle to the Romans. And we pray this morning that as a congregation that you will teach us in the coming weeks more and more and more and more of your truth through the epistle to the Romans. Teach us, Father. And I pray that we will obey and we will respond rightly to the words of truth. I pray for those who may be close. They have the knowledge they even agree with what's been preached, but they have not put their trust in Jesus. I pray they will do that today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your wonderful attention. It seemed like it got a little bit warm for me. Usually on a Sunday morning, I see some ladies fanning and some who are freezing. But I think we're all kind of warm today. Stand with me. And let's go in the name of the Lord and in His grace and peace. I, that's what I pray. That as you leave here today, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the peace of the Holy Spirit will go with you all. Amen.